Christian, are you there? Are you with us? Yes. C can you hear me? We can yeah. hear you. Uh, we can't okay. see you yet, but we, at least we can hear you. Okay, I'll I'll try to to turn on the camera. I, I hope I will won't have any connection like issue with the connection. <laughs> And it works. <laughs> welcome to the session. Also, welcome to the session, all of the uh, participants. Um, we're looking forward for intense discussions on uh, unsupervised and representation learning. So, um, yeah, Christian, go ahead with your first spotlight presentation to get your paper back into the mind of everyone. So, I guess I can use the. I can share the screen. I guess. Can you hear me? Yes, I think you should be able to, uh, Yanis. Okay, okay. No, it's, it was just to 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 be sure. Uh, okay, so let me. Okay, so I'll use the the poster. Uh, there should be working. Sorry for the delay. And share there. Uh, screen. Okay, can you can you see? Yep. Okay. So if I understood properly, it would be a three minute introduction, right? Just to, as a recap of the paper. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. So hi everyone. Uh, thank you for all joining. Uh, I see there is a lot of people there. So. <laughs> Just uh, feel free to interrupt and ask questions after if everything is not clear about what I'm saying. I'm Christian Abbe, a PhD student at EPFL uh, Switzerland. And uh, I'm going to introduce to you basically our paper, which is called self proof to adapt in for short SRA, which is based on self-supervised learning and unsupervised domain adaptation. So you can see basically this paper as a two-step approach. The first step is really based on the unsupervised um, learning and self-supervised learning, where we first, as many papers are doing, uh, and this is well known in the literature now, we try to optimize the feature space. To do so, we use, uh, to do so, sorry, we use two different loss uh, that are listed here. So we have an in-domain loss that is, um, that where the goal is actually to learn the consistency of the source and target data set. And then we have a cross-domain loss where we try to align the features. So you might ask, why are we doing all of this? Maybe uh, I'm, the, the, the structure is not correct, but basically the idea is the following, is that in the medical domain, you usually have unlabeled data in your, in your, uh, in your data, basically. And the, the idea will be to use data online uh, from labeled sources, and then to use those labeled sources on your unlabeled data. But to do so, usually you have like a kind of domain shift between the label online and your label data that you can see, for example, here, you have like different texture. I don't, I hope you can see the mouse. And the goal is basically to manage to align those two feature space. So as I previously said, we use like two different classes, one in domain and one cross domain. And the most interesting part, let's say is the cross domain, cross domain one, where we use entropy to uh, align features. So the idea is the following. If uh, you have an image in what we call the source uh, data set, which is the one where you have labels and um, a representation there, and you have another representation of the same image in uh, the target or the source domain, so you can see here, if you compute uh, the, um, the distance or the similarity between those two, for example, using cosine distance, you will end up with high similarity between uh, those two samples. And if you plot the distribution between uh, the query sample that you have and all the samples that you have in, uh, in the other data set, you should have only a few samples that match your query. And based on this, you can optimize using entropy uh, to align the feature space. And as you can see here uh, in the okay. second one, this is what you end up if you just optimize without trying to align the features. And if you force the alignment, this is what you end up with where you have green and orange with the distribution of the two data sets. And here you have, for example, some uh, graphical examples. I know some of you might not be used to histology. So um, I will just uh, explain briefly. So you, you, we have like three type of tissue, mainly containing like usually cancer. And as you can see, here, you have like different uh, classes and classification. And the final one is uh, our SRI results. 
I'm sorry, I was not really ready for this <laughs> three minutes. The, the, the structure was really helpful. I'm really sorry for this. I hope overall it was still clear, but please uh, ask any, anything if you have a remaining question. That's it for me. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Christian. If you have any questions, please feel free to use the chat. Uh, we already put an example in there. Please remember to always put the presentation number in front, for example, D1, and then your question. Um, yeah. If yeah. it's referring to your <laughs> to the first uh, paper, of course, uh, from Christian. And now we go on with the next spotlight, which will be given by uh, Stefan Jolbe from the DTU in Copenhagen. So looking forward for that one. Hello, um, I'm just setting up this interface here. Okay, you should hear me and be able to see my slides. Okay, looks good. Um, Yeah, so I'm Steffen Scholbe from the University of Copenhagen and DTU. Um, and I will tell you a little bit about my work on semantic similarity metrics for learned image registration. Now, most image registration frameworks um, follow the same strategy. They minimize an objective or less function consisting out of a regularizer and a similarity metric. And in this talk, I want to focus on the similarity metric. Um, the similarity metric judges the difference between the aligned image and the target image. So it is quite essential to judging how good is our current transformation. And it's very important for both the optimization process and the final outcome. Now in literature, there are a couple of commonly used similarity metrics. I like to group them into three categories. There are intensity-based metrics where we look at aligning pixel intensity values. An example here would be the mean squared error. There are key point based metrics where we focus on aligning annotated key points. And there are correlation based metrics where we look at correlations between image patches. But both intensity based metrics and correlation based metrics ultimately look at pixel intensities. And the inbuilt assumption here is that as long as the pixel intensities of both images are close to each other or strongly correlated, then our images are well aligned. But I think uh, pixel intensities are not always a good indicator for good alignment. And, and what I want to challenge this assumption. I think in image registration, we should focus more on aligning image parts of the image of a similar function or similar content. I think the semantic meaning of the image parts is more important here. And so I introduce a fourth category, which I call semantic similarity metrics, where we focus on aligning image parts with a similar semantic meaning. Now, in our method, the method we propose is a two-step method. First, we train a semantic feature extraction network. This is a standard unit uh, trained on a proxy task. We try both outer encoders and segmentation here. And after we train this network, we can use the kernels we learned here to extract features of semantic importance from our images. So you can see on the left here that we extract this feature pyramid. And then we use this to train a registration network, and we use these features we extract in the loss function to judge the similarity. We compared against multiple common baselines on three different data sets. Across all three data sets, we observe a high registration accuracy with our method, uh, performing best on two out of the three data sets. On the right-hand side of the slide, you can see that we observe smooth transformation fields in noisy image patches. So here we have a patch of a noisy background area of one of the images. You can see the baseline method, normalized cross-correlation here, is, has a quite um, noisy transformation map. And that's because this method just tries to align this noise between the images. But our method, DeepSum, that focuses on the semantic importance of the image, has learned that all this noise has no semantic meaning and thus ignores it. And we get a much smoother transformation field in this area. And finally, in the bottom left, um, we 
currently have a preprint out on topological anomaly detection, where we also use registration models in the method. And here it has also shown that using a semantic similarity a metric is a big step up over traditional metrics like the mean squared error. Yeah, and with that, I want to conclude this short spotlight. Questions are welcome either here or at the poster session later. Thank you, Stefan. I think we can move on to the last uh, speaker of the session, which is uh, Chao Feng. For our three minutes. Uh, okay. Hi, uh, thank you, uh, Yanis and uh, Caroline, and uh, thank you for the two previous uh, speakers for a nice introduction. Uh, I'm going to share my screen now. Uh, all right, hopefully you can see my screen. Uh, yes. Sorry? Yes, it's oh, okay, fine. Okay, cool, thank you. So uh, uh, similar to the first speaker, uh, our work is also applied to uh, histopathology images. So our work, uh, the title of our work is Nuke to WEC, Learning Representations of Nuclei in Histopathology Images with Contrastive Loss. Um, we know that uh, a tumor microenvironment is, plays a very important role in the uh, growth and metastasis of cancer. And one aspect of tumor microenvironment is the spatial interactions of various different kinds of nuclei uh, in cancer tissue. And uh, histopathology images provide a holistic morphological picture for the cancer tissue. So it uh, uh, serves as an important tool for both the basic research and the clinical assessment of cancer. Uh, and recent development in nuclear uh, segmentation and the nuclear classification enables large scale delineation of nucleus in histopathology images, uh, thus provide a, a new opportunity to study the tumor microenvironment more quantitatively. Uh, but the current method mostly only classify these nuclei into one of several categories, such as tumor, lymphocytes, or stroma. Uh, but from you know pathologist experience, there is uh, actually uh, much more diverse population of nuclei in cancer tissue, and we can know this from other technologies such as single cell RNA seq or um, multiplex tissue imaging. Uh, but these diversity also uh, present as uh, the variation of uh, uh, individual nuclear morph morphology in histopathology images. So our interest is to develop a method that can re learn representation vectors of nucleus based on their morphological features in histopathology images. Uh, and we hope these uh, representation can be, uh, uh, can capture the subtle differences between different various different type of subtypes of nuclei. Uh, and um, so basically we, we selected uh, a 10 type of, uh, 10 different type of cancer, including colorectal cancer, breast cancer, ovarian cancer, et cetera from the MSK impact patient cohort. Uh, and we select, uh, you know, certain tiles from these uh, slides. And we use a nuclear segmentation uh, method called Hovernet to conduct nuclear segmentation. Uh, and then we develop these uh, uh, contrastive learning method we call NUC2WEC, uh, which I explained in detail in, in the pre-recorded talk. But I'm of course happy to answer any questions later. So with this method, uh, we can learn representations of uh, these uh, nuclear images centered each of the uh, around each of the segmented nuclei, uh, and with these representations, we performed. Uh, can go to next slide. Uh, we performed a, a, a theoretical clustering, um, and find over 100 uh, clusters uh, of uh, nuclear uh, of nuclei with uh, each cluster with their own uh, distinctive morphological features. And uh, our long-term goal is to uh, use the spatial interactions of, um, uh, sorry, use the spatial distributions of these uh, nucleus from various subtypes that are discovered by our method to construct uh, uh, slide-wise uh, features or, or representations that can be used for uh, downstream uh, clinical tasks such as uh, survival analysis. 
Uh, so with that, I'm happy to answer any questions in this discussion and uh, uh, also later in the poster section. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Yanis, if you want to start with the, some uh, question. I am happy to, and actually we already have uh, several questions in the chat. Uh, please uh, feel free to go on with that. Um, maybe we can start with one question that was uh, raised regarding the second talk from Stefan Jolbes, so the, uh, the uh, semantic similarity metric for image registration. And um, there was a question raised in the chat that was also raised in the study group, and this is um, regarding the um, that the deformation will be smooth within the semantic region, and this also means that um, that specific features that are not included in the semantic region will be ignored by this method. So the question would be um, how your how smooth the method is in the um, in the features that are not grasped by the by the encoder because you mainly um, worked on the on the segmentation part. So. Compared to some previous attempts at this, who do just align segmentation maps, we align not segmentation maps, but these uh, semantic feature representations. And we also extract them at multiple levels of abstraction. So we include both very low level features, just mm -hmm. from one convolu convolutional uh, layer, and also more high level features. And if you would only use very high level features, then it would definitely be a risk that within your segmentation areas, um, finer details are lost. But since we also include um, less abstract features, we did not observe this issue. So it's basically due to the to the multi level approach that you're you're doing there. Yes. Yeah. Cool. Thank you very much. Caroline, do you have another question? Uh, yes, maybe we can uh, we can go on to the next question in the in the chat, which is from Lucas. He says, uh, "Would your approach also work for uh, multimodal um, registration?" He says, for example, between uh, CT uh, and MRI. And he said, "Also, how could you compare embeddings from different modalities? Would you have to train your network on different proxy tasks?" So this is why also my question: uh, Was it tested on monomodal or multimodal uh, registration? Because I think you tested several data sets in your paper, and I, I was not able to, you know. Yes. Yeah, so so we, we tested this on multiple def data sets for multiple modalities, but each individual data set was only of a single modality. Um, to adapt this method to do cross-modality image registration, you would have to learn a common representation of, of your images. And I think at NURPS last year, there was a paper from a Swedish university attempting something like that. Um, so th there has some work being done in that direction. Um, not quite exactly the same what, what I'm doing here. Um, but yeah, so you could adapt this idea of using representations and merging your modalities to a common representation to to drive a registration model okay great uh, thank you very much and maybe we can uh, go on with another question uh, regarding the third talk so the noob to deck framework or the noob to deck idea um and uh, there's a question, um, since your method relies on a given segmentation net, um, it could be expected to see some influence um, of this choice on the learned shape embedding for noob 2 So a bit on um, the, I guess it's on the, um, on the relationship between the segmentation accuracy and um, your noob 2 embeddings. Could you comment on that? Um, Are you still muted, I guess? Yeah, uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm actually not sure if I understand the question completely. Uh, but so, so the question about the, the segmentation method we use, uh, I think the, the segmentation result wise, I, we found that qualitatively, uh, you know, the seg segmentation result seems to be pretty good. Uh, but uh, we we didn't really try at the training time. We didn't really try other segmentation or detection method. Uh, but I did have uh, some result which I, I don't think I have officially put anywhere. But uh, at testing time, we did have our own lab previously. It was actually um, a paper from Middle maybe two years ago called Voca. Is developed by my colleague, which is a nuclear detection instead of a segmentation method. 
and use this nuclear detection method, you know, at testing time, we can still assign these detecting nucleus into the clusters that are defined by NIP2Y and qualitatively still behaves, uh, uh, you know, can, can assign that basically the nucleus with similar morphologies to the, uh, to the cluster that, that discovered uh, at training time. But we didn't, uh, in training time, we didn't try different uh, nuclear segmentation methods. I hope that answers the question. Maybe I can quickly follow up. Um, so uh, my question was more regarding whether you would introduce some kind of prior of the, the shapes that your segmentation network can represent and, and if that could uh, kind of restrict the, the space of, of um, um, distributions in the embedding you can represent in, for the differences in the clusters. Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, so. Um, I, I think I think uh, if I understand correctly, the concern is still about whether the segmentation method can, for example, whether it will miss certain type of nuclei, or it might, for example, not be able to uh, segment and overlap uh, nuclei. Uh, this sort of scenario, uh, but just qualitatively based on our our experience, we found that. It, it's possible. It's possible that, that there are a lot, uh, there could be false uh, negatives, meaning they might miss some nuclei. But based on you know uh, viewing a lot of segmentary results, it, it, it's our impression that it it actually performs uh, relatively uh, good. Um, and and we had a lot of visualization of of the nuclei, uh, you know, nuclear image centered around each segmented nuclei. Uh, which we realized uh, within each cluster that we discovered, it seems like they all behave quite uh, nicely. So I hope that answers the question. Yes, it seems like it. So uh, maybe we can stay with you for uh, another uh, question on your um, uh, work, uh, Xiao. So uh, Alicia is asking, uh, how uh, do you decide the number of, of uh, important embeddings or clusters? And also, what types of techniques uh, did you explore to handle the high resolution uh, pathology data sets during training? Uh, thank you. So in terms of deciding the number of uh, uh, clusters, um, so the procedure we do the clustering is after we learned a 128 dimensional embedding for each of the uh, segmented nucleus. And we had, a, uh, we sampled 10K, uh, we had a 1 million uh, nuclear instance, instances as a training data set, and we randomly sampled 10K, uh, oh, sorry, 100K from this 1 million data set and performed a hierarchical clustering with word linkage. Uh, in terms of the uh, number of cl uh, clusters, we did a uh, uh, sensitive analysis. Uh, so <clears throat> uh, we used the sign uh, package for hierarchical clustering, but when we cut the flag clusters, we used uh, the procedure from HDB scan. Uh, meaning we didn't just cut the flag cluster, but rather we want to find uh, clusters with di different sizes or, or granularities. So we so there's one parameter there, which is the minimum cluster size, which we did. Uh, sensitive analysis and and look at how the the uh, mutual adjust adjusted mutual information between uh, clusters uh, changes and we found that it doesn't really change that much so eventually the, the number of clusters is actually determined by qualitatively that you know uh, within each cluster they share similar morphologies and and between clusters they they have distinctive differences these uh, we we did uh, the second author of the paper is the uh, board certified pathologist. So we, uh, this was uh, eventually the 140 clusters was determined by a qualitative procedure. And I think the second part of the question is uh, how do I handle high, I'm not sure if I un understand this question, but uh, all I can say is that the, the, the image we have at MSK, uh, Mamar Sloan uh, Catering Cancer Center, are all scanned in 20X. And uh, the Hubernet, which is developed from uh, Rajput Group in University of Warwick, they were trained on a data set with it, uh, with, uh, which was scanned at 40x. So I, all I did was uh, rescale all, all the uh, nuclear images uh, 
to uh, 100, uh, sorry, to 40x. Um, but I'm not sure if I, I answered the second part of the question. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. And uh, we can go on with, with the question uh, to the first presentation to Christian Abbe. Once you're here. Yes, I'm there. I'm there. I'm yeah, listening. Hi, great. Uh, amazing. Um, I was wondering about the, the loss functions that you were using. Um, you use this contrast of loss for the, for the in-domain um, for the in domain constraint. Um, and there you uh, rely on your um, augmentation methods or where you draw from a set of transformations. Um, how do you think your method relies on how to uh, get uh, useful uh, transformations and also um, if, if we have a little, little cross question here because um, at the loop to vec uh, they um, use some kind of augmentation that is very uh, very specific for this domain where they change backgrounds or something and within the pathological thing so could you comment on the robustness of your method or how how sensitive it is to choosing the right transformations here yeah 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 thank you for the question first and uh, it is actually as you said a really tricky task because uh, I mean, it's not new. We all know that the transformation depends on the type of data you're using. So it really, really depends if you're using data from ImageNet, you would not expect the same transformation. Uh, like the most simple example is like actually the horizontal or vertical flip where it doesn't make sense to put a cat upside down, but it makes sense to actually turn around and make like the, the pathology slide upside down. So we tried, uh, we tried actually uh, a lot of transformation. It's actually another idea we had for the future work to more more generalized to see what is the impact of the transformation on the embedding like does it really matters and does it change a lot uh, in our experience what we did is mostly color transformation to the due to the staining variation that are really important you also have to take into account and the saturation of the background because if you do some staining augmentation then it will change the color of the background which is not really correct with what you can see in the staining procedures for example, you can become a big, a bit uh, purple or pink, which is not the case in a, in a real case and I, in the, in real images because it just stays white or, or a bit darker. Uh, so those are the main one we use. Also, the blurriness was also something that was really useful for us because with the the focal, I mean, the, with the scanner itself, sometimes you have like a problem with the focus itself of the camera that you have to deal with, and this is like intrinsic of your data, so it's not something like with the post processing. Is the, the the camera itself? So this were like the the most let's say the most important basic one we used and uh, that we had to implement. Otherwise, what not even working? <laughs> yeah, yeah, interesting. And maybe short follow up question on that. Um, you used these two different losses. Did you uh, play around with some weighting between them? And does this yeah. also depend on the transformations, or did you just the fifty fifty weighting? Or um, how crucial is this for uh, the success of the method? Uh, glad you asked because we, we will like to add like more details on the paper. We are writing and running more experiments because we had like such a short uh, space uh, within the main text. We put like some in the supplementary, but we always want to do more, right? You already, and, have, already have a long appendix. so <laughs> Yeah, but there is more coming. <laughs> and um, now a uh, good question. Uh, we tried for the first experiment to make it simple. We did 50-50. So we had like the same amount of sample from the source and the target and everything was like shared half. Uh, but then you can ask yourself, uh, for example, if uh, you use, you have a, a source images where you have, let's say, um, an even like a run, a even distribution of your data. So you have the same number of normal tissue, cancer tissue, lymphocytes, mucinous. So everything is, uh, is this, have the same amount of example. And then you feed the example of your data where it's a bit biased because, for example, if you're scanning slide with cancer, almost all the whole slide is just cancerous tissue. So the distribution of the classes are not the same. And this is what, what kind of bothering us when we were doing this. And this is something we're still trying to fix uh, because I don't think you can, the, the, good, the, the correct answer would be to find a way to know what is the distribution of your data in terms of classes in the first place and then to adjust accordingly. And this is something we, we, we don't know yet how to do, at least. So I don't know if you truly really properly answer the question of the balance 50-50, but still, like, this is like the, the, the outcome is just like it's in progress and we're trying to find a, a really good way to do it in a proper way. Yeah. Great, thanks. So uh, we are um, 
close to finishing the sessions a bit over time, but we started a bit late, so um, we are already done. Uh, however, um, we are not completely done with <laughs> with discussing these uh, these great papers here. Um, you all, or all of the three authors, um, will have a, a poster in the poster session later on today, and the poster is also hanging here uh, for the next days. Um, so uh, there is enough or plenty of space for in-depth discussions. And also, uh, please remember that you can also always find the authors um, in the participants list and uh, click on locate on map, so you can catch them up wherever they are and have some discussions somewhere here in Gather Town. So um, yeah, thank you very much for um, for these uh, nice questions, for intense discussions. I'm very sorry we could not raise all the questions here, but um, yeah, there are plenty of other options and. Let's give a warm round of applause for all the three authors again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.